Hi, everyone. This is Dr. Jenny Hobson and Dr. Elena Heron here to present on how to age proof your body. As we get older, we all need tips on how to improve our health. And here is a presentation to help you do this. If you'd like a uh, free 15 minute consult afterwards, we are willing to meet with you. Just give us a call at 312 986 9833 and we can schedule you an appointment. I'm gonna go ahead and pull up the presentation and go ahead, Elena. All right, so thank you, Jenny. Yes, I'm Elena. Um, so I work here in the loop um, and I do both orthopedics and pelvic floor physical therapy. So I'll start talking about our age proof of our body. Um, so one of the things is restoring proper posture, breathing and building strength and mobility. These are all really important pieces to make sure that we're looking and feeling younger. Both are very important. Um, so you can go to the next thing. There we go. So there are multiple things that happen to our bodies as we age. Um, there are definitely changes that are normal, but things that we can try and adjust. So thing, first things is uh, bones, they decrease in size and density. So as we go on in the presentation, we'll talk a little bit more about ways to kind of modify this and counteract it. But I just wanna go through at least the first list of what's going on. So other things are muscles, decrease in strength, endurance, and flexibility. So even that too, if we, if we feel like, you know, we aren't able to walk as long, we aren't able to exercise as long, oftentimes that can be due to the muscles. Uh, next is stiffening blood vessels require the heart to work harder and impact the cardiovascular system. So what's happening there too is that once you have that stiffening of blood vessels and we're making our heart work harder, it can be a lot more difficult for us to exchange oxygen, um, get blood flow to the muscles. So that can all kind of impact what's going on too when it comes to exercise and aging. Metabolism also slows with body burning, fewer calories at rest. So there are, are some things that we can do to kind of help with that. So this is kind of now we're getting into how do we limit then that impact of these age-related changes. So we know that these things are probably gonna happen. What can we do about them? So first thing are follow guidelines of physical activity, strengthening, cardiovascular, and stretching. So there's a lot of things that are recommended by the American College of Sports Medicine, or it's also known as the ACSM. Um, so you want to make sure you have a lot of recovery time after exercise, especially because our body needs to rest. We need to allow ourselves time to kind of recoup and get back into it to be able to get to the next set of exercises. So rest is really important. Also eating a balanced diet. So that's going to help too with your metabolism. It's going to help with weight, muscle growth, everything. So making sure you have a nice balanced diet. You want to monitor for changes and compensations and make sure you seek support. Um, especially from a physical therapist, and don't just accept changes as, you know, just getting older. Uh, next thing are activity recommendations from the ACSM. So that's that College of Sports Medicine that we were talking about earlier. So aerobic training, the first thing you want to look at are the three to five aerobic training sessions per week for 20 to 60 minutes per session. So at least getting to that 150 minutes total per week is going to be giving you that good aerobic training. Aerobic especially is good for the heart. So this is where we're really focusing on oxygen consumption into the blood, getting that oxygen into the muscles. So that can be really, really important for that cardiovascular health. Next thing is resistance training. So for this, you wanna do two to three resistance training sessions per week, about two to four sets and eight to 20 repetitions. So I usually say with a lot of my patients, depending on what's going on, my average is usually about three sets of, 10 repetitions, that's kind of what I usually go for. Now you can always adjust it to kind of what's going on. And that's where your physical therapist can really help you too, to modify it, to get to be what you need. Um, another thing is including plyometric training for building and maintaining strength and power. So plyometrics is really just forces with quicker movements, really focusing on the speed and force that's produced in the muscle. So that can be a really, really great thing also to get some resistance training going. Um, additional pieces that we'll touch on are the flexibility training. So about two to three flexibility sessions per week for those major muscle groups. So major muscle groups include, you know, your lower legs, your quads, which are on the front of your legs, um, you know, biceps off on the front of your arm. 
uh, those kind of more major muscles, you want to hold it for at least 60 seconds. So by holding for that 60 seconds, you're able to allow your muscles to really elongate and allow that good flexibility to, because if you're only going for like five, 10 seconds, you're not going to have enough time to really get that good change in the muscle length. And you want to do that for about two to four repetitions. For balance training, which is also very important, especially as we age, because we want to prevent falls. You know, the more falls, the higher risk we have of fractures, everything like that. So by working on balance, we can really help to prevent any kind of serious injuries. For this, you want to do about two to three balance sessions per week for about 20 to 30 minutes. You can combine activities. So this is a nice thing because I know it's probably a little bit overwhelming to be hearing, I should be doing this, this, and this for this long and this long. So sometimes it's nice to think of when I'm really busy, how can I combine this all to make it the most bang for my buck? So by doing that, you can look at doing yoga or Tai Chi. Those are two really great options because they combine a lot of those different pieces and elements of it. You also, if you're limited in following these guidelines because of joint pain or injuries, your physical therapist can help. So that's kind of what I was talking about before where if some of these you're like, I don't know how many repetitions I should be doing. I don't know how I need to modify it. That's absolutely something. Talk to your physical therapist. They can find the right thing for you. Recovery is also a big piece. I know I talked about that a little bit earlier, but sleep is a huge part of recovery. So you want to aim for seven to nine hours of sleep every night. When you get that good seven to nine hours, you're able to get a better mood. You're able to get that lower risk of disease, support weight maintenance and metabolism, improve concentration and memory, and heal and repair heart and blood vessels. So if you're not getting sleep, oftentimes I find that my patients don't have as good of a prognosis or it just takes longer for them to get better because they don't have that time when they're just lying there for their body to really kind of digest everything that's going on and really make sure that it's healing itself. Um, with rest too, after age 35, your peak endurance capacity is affected by a reduction in your maximum oxygen consumption. What does that mean? <laughs> so that basically just means that um, when you're having, you're using your muscles, they aren't as effective at bringing oxygen in. So their endurance is a lot shorter and you aren't able to be able to do an exercise for as longer or walk for as longer. So that's something where increased recovery time helps with that, will help with your endurance. So giving a little bit of a break between the sets that you're using, um, this, the sets of the exercises that you're doing. And then um, how much of this decline relates to stiffness of the rib cage and strength of muscles of respiration? Um, so that piece is really coming into play in that oxygen consumption. So when you're taking a nice breath in and your rib cage is really stiff and you aren't able to get that good uh, total expansion of the rib cage and total recoil of the rib cage, then you aren't gonna be able to get as much time for the oxygen to flow through and perfuse into the blood. So you're not getting as much oxygen into the blood, which means you're not getting as much oxygen to the muscles. And same thing's happening then with the strength, strength of the muscles of respiration. If you have weakness there in the muscles of respiration, you're not able to get as good of a breath, get as much oxygen into your body. Things you can do to help with healthy eating making sure that you're choosing good vegetables, fruit, whole grains, really just being mindful of the things that you're eating, um, trying to eat those high fiber foods and uh, lean sources of protein, making sure you're avoiding more of those high saturated fats, salts, sugars, um, ensuring that you have adequate intake of vitamin D, calcium, omega-3 fatty acids. These are all things that your physical therapist can help you with. And um, otherwise, if this is ever something where you know, you have more questions on it. The physical therapist um, can always give you a referral to, to talk to a nutritionist, or you can always talk to your doctor as well. Um, but there's a lot of great places that you can get some of these good vitamin D calcium sources in your diet. Uh, so here we're going to look at monitoring for compensation. So this is also a piece as we get older. I know sometimes you can think of, you see someone, they're kind of more hunched over. Um, especially depending on what you've done for as a profession, you know, what's going on structurally in your body. So your posture can really affect, especially from those age-related changes where you're usually going more forward. What's happening there is that then the curvature of your spine and your back is starting to lean forward and you get more flexion of that, of that spine. 
So that can lead to, especially if you have any kind of osteoporosis or risk of osteoporosis, you have an increased risk then of fracture of your vertebrae, which no one wants to have that. Those are essential for you to be able to have good posture, live pain-free. So with working on posture, we wanna set yourself up for success in the fight against gravity that will bring you forward. Um, breathing mechanics are also another piece. And so Dr. Hobson will discuss this in a little bit. So I'll let her kind of go through uh, how it activates the core. Um, and then same thing with breath holding. It kind of creates that false sense of stability. Uh, I'm sure Dr. Hobson's gonna be talking, talking a little bit about that as well, but um, just as a little overview for that, you can see this kind of like Coca-Cola can. So oftentimes when we're doing a difficult exercise or you're doing something that's hard or challenging, we hold our breath instead of breathing. And so if you were to be exhaling while you're doing an exercise, you can tell that you're, you feel a little bit less stable than if you were holding your breath, but that way your muscles are working. You're not just using this intra-abdominal pressure in our abdomen to keep ourselves stable. And instead we're using our muscles, we're being active and allowing ourselves to build up that stability in the core. All right, so Dr. Hobson, take it away. All right. Hi, everyone. This is um, a little introduction to what we do at the Renaissance Craniofacial Group. Um, just so you know, we do talk a lot about the tongue, and the tongue is something that not many people do talk about. But I want you to be aware that the function of the tongue is huge in many aspects of health. Um, so craniofacially, as we develop from being an infant to an adult, that tongue within the oral cavity will create pressure against the palate, against the roof of the mouth, against the mandible to grow it forward and wider. So that's very important for growth and development of the face and the cranium. It also supports the uh, soft palate. The soft palate is the, you're basically, if you open your mouth, the soft palate is that little dangly uvula. It's that all that tissue back there that stays lifted if it's properly supported by the back of the tongue. Many of us have a low tongue posture and that creates a problem because there's not that support back there. Now, eating and transferring food, that's obviously a tongue function. Swallowing is a tongue function. That's something that you might've already thought of. Um, articulation and speech, those are very vital, um, very important functions of the tongue, but I don't, I want to reiterate the function of the tongue and, and, and how it, it's involved in breathing is very important and not many people understand it. And that's why we're bringing it to your attention. So what does a low tongue posture do? It actually can lead to snoring and airway compromise. So here is an image of like a cross section of your face. Here's your spine in the back. Here's your airway in your throat. Here's your tongue and your lips and your nose. So you'll notice that this, this is bone right here. That's your hard palate. And then back here, it's more reddish pink. That's your soft palate. These, anything reddish pink is, is muscle, whereas the yellowish brown is more bone. Um, so you'll notice that the tongue has a gap here. This is a very typical, and you might see this on x-rays because the, the x-ray will show a little space or a darker space where the tongue should actually be filling the oral cavity like it does back here. When that happens, this part of the soft palate is not going to drop. When you have the support of the back of the tongue, um, and you can tell in this picture, you do not have the support. This is soft tissue. So without that support, it's going to fall down and create a possibility for you to start snoring, right? So we wanna make sure that we eliminate the possibility of any snoring or sleep apnea development. Here is an image of two different ways to develop the face. And one is with nose breathing and one is with mouth breathing. So the mouth breathing, you'll notice it's very different than the nose breathing. We'll start with just the image here of the jawline. This is a very strong jaw versus the, the mouth breather has a very kind of 
narrow jaw and it's not as chiseled here. You can see that there is a, a bit of a clockwise, we call it a clockwise uh, facial growth development where this one, this one, you want to have a strong jaw. You want to develop um, kind of a wide jaw and a forward mid face. So looking at this image here, you can see he's nice and strong face. Um, you can see that the lips are together here. The nose is not bent. The eyes look awake. Um, the ears are even, he's pretty symmetrical. Now going down to the mouth breather, you'll see that the face is more narrow. We consider this called uh, a, a um, long face syndrome when the mouth is kept open. And this is what I mean by open. It's just parted. It's not necessarily gaping open, but if the mouth is open and the tongue is down to allow uh, mouth breathing to occur over the tongue through the mouth, that pressure of the tongue right at the roof of the mouth is no longer there. And you end up having a high narrow palate and that high narrow palate will develop a bent nose. So that septum that we all say that we have a deviated septum and we've never had a, um, a fall to the face or a punch in the nose, that occurs over time as the, as the child is developing into an adult if you've never had an injury, that high narrow palate, that roof of the mouth that goes up high instead of being nice and round, it goes high and it ends up bending the nose, causing more problems breathing through the nose. So with a bend symptom, you always have one side that's a little more open than the other and always a little um, resistance to breathing. It creates a narrowed nose creates resistance to breathing, unfortunately. And the mouth ends up being a lot easier to breathe through. So poor breathing habits promote poor posture. If you can see this, this is the ideal situation. Your head is over your spine. It's kind of stacked up. That cranium weighs about 12 to 15 pounds. And when it's positioned properly over the spine, it's distributed through the entire spine. As that head goes forward an inch or even two, three inches, you can see that the weight distribution of that head with the longer lever arm creates more load on the spine, creating more wear and tear, more um, malalignment use. So what I mean by malalignment use is that your bones are out of a position and then you're rotating your head or say you're rounded in your upper back because you're in this position here. Your shoulder blades are no longer really positioned correctly, well, you end up slowly straining your, your rotator cuff muscles. These muscles need proper spinal alignment to be used properly. Over time, that will cause a change in the way that we use our respiratory system. If our mouth is open, we end up using our scalenes, our sternocleidomastoid, these muscles that are more chest and neck versus your diaphragm right? Your diaphragm is the bigger muscle in the lower belly. So the, the, the neck ends up being very hyperactive and the head starts to pull forward without you even realizing this happens. Well, that will lead to neck pain, to clenching, to DMD or TMJ, um, temporomandibular joint, um, the jaw joint um, pain, and maybe clicking or locking then that slowly, like these are the types of patients that we see are all these patients that have issues with neck pain, headaches, clenching, jaw problems, snoring, sleep apnea, and even tinnitus or tinnitus. So the tongue and the airway and clenching. So this is an x-ray of the side view of your face. You can see it's very similar to what we saw earlier. This is the tongue. This is your airway. Now, believe it or not, this airway should be 100 millimeters squared at the most narrowest spot to be normal. This patient is at 18.6 millimeters squared. That is basically almost like constricted in the back, suffocating because of the tongue posture up against the back of the oral pharyngeal wall or, or the airway um, tube. So that tongue is basically pressing up against 
the back wall of your air tube, um, your airway, and all day, what patients do to compensate for this is they clench, they clench. Why do they clench? They clench to open up that space, to create more airway space. So I need you to understand that chronic clenching might, might be stress, but a lot of times it's an airway problem that's hidden that a lot of people don't realize it is. They wear, they wear all kinds of mouth guards and mouth appliances. They break through them. If you have a history of eating your appliances or cracking them or always breaking them and needing more, I recommend that you come in for a consult just to see if you actually have an airway compromise. So this is one way to, to identify it is to take this x-ray and to understand um, what kind of condition your throat is in. So breathing connects the core. We talked about the diaphragm just now. The diaphragm contributes. And if you look here, it's a massive muscle. It, it, it sits right under the rib cage here and it supports the back. It creates stability for the back if it's used properly. There's some people that don't use the, the diaphragm at all. Their mouth is open, they're parted, their mouth breathing. Well, when your mouth breathe, remember you use their neck muscles rather and your chest muscles rather than your diaphragm. Once you close your mouth, your diaphragm will start engaging. And as you inhale, it should lower and expand. As you exhale, it should come more up, up the body and under the rib cage. This happens and it creates a lymphatic drainage in that area, which is very important. It also creates a connection of the upper and the lower quarter of the body. Um, but you want, without this type of diaphragmatic breathing, you can engage the core effectively. This ends up leading to problems with your hip flexors being tight, your spinal extensors, your lower back muscles being overactive and compensating and eventually causing more back pain. Um, and even we talked about breath holding, Elena had mentioned it about the effects of breath holding. You want your ribs to move. You want your rib cage to not be rigid. You want that nice expansion and contraction of your rib cage. Um, so, so many people pull in their belly and try to keep their belly tight all day to, to, to look thinner. It's not a good way because you're not really using your, your diaphragm correctly or you're not using your rib cage expansion and contraction correctly. So know that that's not good to do. Um, you will also have impaired weight shift, the way that our body shifts back and forth walking and gait, you should have a symmetrical arm swing and lots of even movement on right and left and breath holding and these types of um, breathing impairments that we're talking about here will cause a shift in that, that weight shift proper mechanics and also um, impaired balance. So we do a lot of vestibular rehab in our clinic uh, and that's for people that are dizzy and feel lightheaded and um, just feeling off like you're on a boat and don't feel right. Well, we have therapists that are specialized in this area as well. So want to just make sure that everybody knows that if you would like to scan this QR code, this goes straight to our website um, and it goes to this presentation. You can have access to it through here. Um, everybody is invited to, if you are interested in making an appointment with us, I'd, I'd like, I'd urge you to um, reach out to us by calling our, our uh, front desk. Our patient care coordinators can help schedule an appointment. We also are in network with Blue Cross Blue Shield, Aetna, United Healthcare, and Medicare. That's for physio partners. The Renaissance team is in network with all of those except for Aetna, but we would like to, to help. And if there's any uh, questions that you may have, you can call the office and schedule an appointment. Elena, do you wanna say anything else? Um, yeah, I was just gonna say, there's also at that link um, at the last part of the presentation, you can also access a home exercise program that kind of goes and gives you a few different ideas um, 
it's just MedBridge, which is an account that has a bunch of exercises. So we've kind of created something that goes along with what the presentation was talking about. So feel free to check that out too, if you want to kind of get yourself started on it um, before you come on in. But definitely recommend coming in if you have any questions or any concerns following this. Wonderful. Thank you so much. Hope Thank to you. See you in the clinic.